first look at what is on the front pages. Time to see what's making the headlines then with the journalist and broadcaster Jenny Kleeman and the PR consultant Alex Dean. Fabulous Hello. to see both of you. Mm -hmm. And welcome, Alex, your first go back in the studio. Thank you very much. Good to be back. Several years, we think, yeah. don't we? <laughs> anyway, let's uh, take a look at the front pages, shall we? The arrest of five suspected Russian spies. Top story for the Metro with their headline, Putin spies seized in the UK. The eye picturing three of the suspects and describes them as Russian spies arrested in UK suburbia. A similar theme in the mail, which calls them spies who came in from suburbia. This is the front of the mirror, the spies next door, the headline there. The Guardian explains that those arrested are Bulgarians suspected of spying for the Russian security services. The Times says they'd been posing as journalists before their arrest. Well, the Telegraph labels them the Northolt spy ring because three of them were arrested close to the RAF base, frequently used by the royal family, amongst others. Daily Express says, meanwhile, there's another big rise in the state pension coming next year, thanks to a large increase in wages and the triple lock, which decides how big the rise should be. The Financial Times reports on moves to buy into and break up one of the big four financial consulting firms, EY, formerly known as Ernst & Young. While The Sun looks ahead to the Women's World Cup semi-final tomorrow, urging the England Lionesses to waltz past the Matildas. And finally, The Star reports that the graves of the fabled Knights Templar have seemingly been found after 800 years in a church in Staffordshire, a discovery it says is worthy of the Da Vinci Code. Anyway, don't forget, scan the QR code that you'll see on screen during the programme. Check out the front pages for yourself of tomorrow's newspapers while you listen to our guests and head straight to them, Jenny and uh, Alex here. So, Alex, talk us through what we know so far and, wh and what the papers have been able to find out about this case, which has been slow to emerge, hasn't it, really? It's been slow for us to find out about, but we must expect our security services to have been on this for quite some time. Five people so far, no sense of whether there are other cells involved that are going to be drawn into it. Three uh, charged and two further being questioned. A couple of interesting things about it for me. The use of Bulgaria as a cover country um, by the Russians is a very old story. You may recall that uh, in From Russia With Love, James Bond runs into a Bulgar connection, and that's uh, part of the story here. Um, a further one is a kind of double bluff being suggested, where one of the people concerned declared on his LinkedIn profile that he was a signal intelligence expert. Well, yes, now we I think we know what sort of signals and intelligence you might have been providing. Allegedly, but, of course. Allegedly, of course. But moreover, it it sits within a picture in which the current head of MI5 has said that more than 100 uh, Russian spies have been deterred from entering the United Kingdom since 2018. It sits in an environment where David Smith, of course, was arrested and sentenced to 13 years in prison um, for his spying in our embassy in Germany. And it just seems that we've been... At least some of these people have been here for quite some mm -hmm. time. We have been penetrated by a foreign intelligence that does not wish us well. And, you know, the picture it paints also is of a Russian president who will not stop uh, at whatever he needs to do to reach his means um, amid, amidst the context of war, obviously. Yes, absolutely. Although, um, by all accounts, these people have been living in this country for quite a long time, so it's, it's not a sleeper cell that was created in response to the Ukraine war. I mean, these people have been here for quite a long time. And it's, it's quite interesting because uh, we now feel like we're in this different digital age and that spying still happens through hacking or spy yeah. balloons or this kind of thing. This shows that old-fashioned sleeper cells who can, who can be people that are trusted by a foreign agent within a country are still a, it's still a method of espionage and there are we haven't had arrests of russian spies in this country for a, a really a very long time but if you think about it there are many unexplained things you know the, at this stage we don't know what these specific people were involved in but for example things like the novichok poisoning there are many yeah. things that we don't know how was the novichok brought into the country so it's, it is it is useful for foreign agents to have people planted in this country who can be called upon when necessary and, and what's really interesting in, in the reporting because obviously the story broke earlier on today these people were arrested on the 8th of february and it's only been an, an announced today and reporters have, have been out getting information about them and they very much were embedded in their communities. They were the spies next door. They made cakes and pies for their neighbours. They lived in Harrow and Great Yarmouth in, in Norfolk. Uh, the, the two of them who were a couple apparently um, used to give classes on British culture, life in the UK, to, to other Bulgarians. So they were very good at kind of 
integrating themselves. So this is not something that's just in response to the Ukraine war. This is a long-term seeded strategy to have useful people, if, the, if these people do turn out to be spies, uh, useful people embedded in the British community. So let's just briefly pick it, and I, this front of the Daily Mail, I stress this person is not me who's on the left, uh, contrary, <laughs> contrary to the views expressed by many wags online before uh, appearing today. Um, it's worth mentioning that, of course, whilst these people were foreign nationals, a number of the people who've been um, interviewed, uh, interrogated, accused and indeed convicted by British authorities have been British nationals who have held sympathy with um, intelligence or activities from abroad, including Smith, who was arrested uh, 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 and convicted because he had sympathy for Putin's invasion of Ukraine. But Melita Norwood was, of course, the, you know, the granny spy in suburbia. You can have an agent or a source for some decades, and part of the point about sleeper cells isn't necessarily that they spy directly. It's that they provide succour and support when those who are spying directly are in trouble or need them. And so that we don't know yet whether these people were directly involved in a great deal of espionage themselves. They may have been... The allegation may be... Allegation. That they, the allegation may be... <laughs> that they were going to be called up to support those who were involved in the front line. And the specific allegations, um, if we look through the Guardian, I mean, I mean nearly all the newspapers are leading on yeah. this. Yes. In a sense, it's a new story for newspapers to get their teeth into in August as well, isn't it? Um, is, is about identity fraud, I suppose, isn't yes. it? Yes. That's, that's the so, point for the specifics of it. There are some quite remarkable details that have come out. <laughs> what we do know from, from their arrest is that they were caught with an enormous number of documents on them. They had, uh, apparently, uh, passports, identity cards, papers for the UK, Bulgaria... Italy, Spain, France, Croatia, Slovenia, Greece and the Czech Republic. The Times is reporting that they had fake press cards and clothing, allowing them, if they had wanted to, to pose as, as journalists from, from Discovery or National Geographic. That would suggest uh, yeah. people either who are holding these documents and materials to help other people pose or people who could do it themselves. But this is sophisticated stuff. This is not, you know, one or two phony documents. This is a, a systematic state-sponsored uh, thing to have to have so many documents, not just from states, but also from from. Uh, Broadcasters. And drawing out that detail about posing um, as that which they were not, as journalists, it, it's also reported that they didn't just do that in the United Kingdom. The same people are accused of doing that abroad, from the UK, using us as a base to spy on friendly countries like Germany. So uh, if these allegations are true, it'll be rather like, you may recall, Angela Merkel said friends don't spy on friends when it turned out the Americans had hacked her phone. It may be unknowingly we were hosting those, not just spying on us, but spying on our allies as well. And the Telegraph makes uh, something of the proximity to an RAF base as yes. well. Uh, the North Holt spy ring they, they talk about here is uh, part of these allegations. Yes. I mean, we don't know the details in all of this. Proximity means a kind of physical proximity there. I mean, one of the things that I found really interesting that is, is kind of brought out in this Telegraph reporting is if people have been in this country for a decade, how, how are they uncovered? Is it through intelligence? Is it through uh, some whisperings coming back from Russia? Or have they slipped up somehow? And it, uh, it, it's gotten in some interesting detail here. The Telegraph have clearly, you know, dispatched their reporters, their three reporters on this story, to go and talk to uh, uh, neighbours. And uh, one of the neighbours of, of the man in North Holt uh, said that the, the Bulgarian claimed to have worked for Interpol and tried to erect a huge satellite dish on the side subtle, of the Subtle, subtle. <laughs> so either that's a very clever <laughs> double bluff or perhaps, uh, you know... He, they, they got a bit arrogant, they got a bit lax, who knows? But, um, you know, it's quite interesting what some of the neighbours are saying, uh, a lot of them saying that they had no reason to doubt them, uh, that they paid their rent on time. She was very good-looking, apparently. It's one of these things where it's like, right, let's scramble our reporters and see what we can yeah. find. We don't know very much at all. Uh, it is all the, 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 the stuff of, of spy novels, really. But what's interesting is that this is still going on at a time when we yeah. expect that everything is, is done virtually... Human beings human with with eyes and houses and safe houses are still are still uh, you know important. Human intelligence still vital, and there will be a film made one day. I have no doubt, and it'll be interesting. But the part of the film that we don't know yet mm -hmm. is to your point about the uncovering. And normally, it's either a stroke of good luck, or despite the good the hard work of our intelligence services, it's a stroke of good luck in catching somebody, or it's because somebody has grasped. It's because mm. somebody internally has said within the Russian system, Britain, you're being spied upon, and it, you might start looking at these people. And if that's the case, I hope the person who put their hand up is safe and secure tonight. Because one thing we do know is that Putin does not tolerate yes. any kind of dissent. Mm, as we know from uh, Novichok and uh, Polonium 210, yeah. remember those cases all too well. I think the Times is also leading on it. Have we got that one too? You've probably seen it. Um, 
there we go. Russian spies accused of posing as journalists. The point you were making earlier, uh, once again, uh, picturing those three who um, have been charged. Trio used forged press cards to carry out surveillance, the police claim. Again, it's allegations, yeah. as we have to stress. Um, but, uh, but, of course, journalists get access into areas that other... You know, other people do not is part of the point you were making. Yes, and that, as, as somebody who's a journalist who relies on this kind of accreditation, that's very worrying that people could think that you're a spy. Quite often you go to certain countries and people assume if you're a journalist you are a spy, this kind of thing won't help. But this reporting suggesting, from what The Times has heard from the police, that these are not people who are holding documents for other people. These are people who are using the documents themselves to get intelligence. Yeah, that's right. And I suppose one other thing to... Um, add about their circumstances is that traditionally within espionage, one sleeper cell or one cell doesn't know about the activities of another. So you're not likely to get that much useful intelligence from these people about ones we haven't discovered yet, which will always leave us guessing the known unknown. Who else is there in Britain? If we've caught these people, is it the case that we've found 100% of the spies? That would seem unlikely, wouldn't it? And therefore you don't know how many others that's there are the alongside them. That's the thing. In the front of the mirror says the spies next door, and that's the thing is... Look at your neighbours closely tonight, as the mirror is saying. You never know. I'm sure they're mostly fine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, lots more still to come in the next part of our programme, including the very latest on the new allegations against Donald Trump. That and more after this. Our customers collect Tesco Club Card points for every fun bill. Welcome back. You are watching the press preview with me once again, the journalist and broadcaster Jenny Kleeman and the PR consultant Alex Dean. Welcome back Hello. to both of you. Uh, let's turn to Trump, shall we? We've uh, moved through uh, allegations concerning Putin, effectively. Now onto Trump. It's like the old mood music, isn't it? Um, here we are. Trump charged using mafia laws over the election in 2020 once again. And Jenny, this time in the state of Georgia, which has implications really for the case. It does because uh, these are not federal charges; they're state charges. So if he were to become president. President, he can't pardon himself. These are racketeering charges that are normally uh, reserved for mobsters, which have a minimum jail service or uh, jail term of, of five years. And it could potentially be televised, this uh, trial, which the other three charges, because he's He's, this is now the fourth criminal char uh, charge. He's got 91 felony charges against him. Four trials happening next year. 2024 is going to be a busy year for him if he's the Republican candidate, because as well as trying to become president, he's also going to be fending off all of these charges in court. But this one is significant, even though you might be struggling to keep up with all the different charges against him. This one is significant because he is going to... He may have to appear uh, in court on TV, and he has 10 days to, to answer, but, you know, he's facing a minimum of five years in jail if he's found guilty. Of course, no matter who the defendant is, no court will convict you in absentia because you're busy defending yourself in another court. So, realistically, he can't get through... He can't be the subject of all these trials before you get to the next election. What, one thing everyone agrees on is that if you're going to do this properly, it's going to take time to go through evidentiary processes and taking testimony and so forth. The idea of doing these four back-to-back and trying to get it done before November, it, it seems pretty much impossible but, to but me. But even one would be clashy with things like Super Tuesday, wouldn't they? Do you know what I mean? It, it, Are you suggesting that they won't get any of them done before the election? I mean, you could certainly see at least one being resolved, but the challenge for the Trump campaign seems to be blithely dismissed, which is, well, so what then? We'll just carry on. Mm -hmm. Jenny is right. The, the, the Georgia case is different in kind because it's one that he wouldn't have the prospect of directly being able to pardon himself. There is a pardoning procedure, but it's by a panel that would be in Georgia and can't exercise its powers until you've served a portion of your sentence. So it's the least attractive one for him to get com convicted on. People will naturally look at this and think the federal charges are the most serious and significant. Actually, it could be the Georgia one that's most challenging for the Trump campaign. But it is worth thinking about the fact that, traditionally at least, state level charges would give way to federal charges in the kind of precedence of batting order. So if you faced a more, traditionally more serious federal charge, that might get heard first. I think Trump's critics would rather like the Georgian one to be uh, taking prominence, given the, the severity of the potential outcome for him. Yes, and a 98-page indictment, very detailed, complex. Uh, one described the, the federal or the Washington uh, indictment we had only recently mm. as a sort of a bit like Hemingway, you know, pithy and short. Yes. And, uh, 
and this one is a bit like War and Peace. Uh, more narrative. Complex. Yes, more narrative. More yeah. narrative. There's um, so much to go into. Yeah, the FT on the front page as well. Um, lots of people talking about uh, this woman we see here, that she's a Democrat, that it's politicised, etc., etc. Which is, you know. of course, what Donald Trump has said. He's always said that this is a, a witch hunt. Each of these charges is always a witch hunt, which is strange, because every time he's indicted, his poll ratings go up. So if it's a witch hunt, it is not one that, that it's not works working. very well. Um, it doesn't, it, you know, it, it, it emboldens his base. And again, I think, you know, as somebody who loves the United States and who cares a lot about geopolitics, it's so depressing for me that, the, that there is, seems to be no way for the Republicans to, to find someone better that their base is going to go for than somebody who's facing so many uh, charges and bringing the country in, into, into so much disrepute. Well, that's, I mean, look, I, I do point out, just gently, that the candidate for president and past serving president is entitled as much to the presumption of innocence as the supposed Russian spooks we just spent the first half of the programme discussing. But, but yes, what, I, he what, is. what I will concede is that he, just taking his behaviour on air, which I'm entitled to judge entirely, I thought he behaved disgracefully after the results of the last um, election. And I, I therefore think, whether he's convicted of any of these things or not, we are as entitled to, as anyone else to say, as great friends of America, like you, I love the country, is this contest the best that the Americans can do? For perhaps the most important job in perhaps the most important country in the world, is it really right that Joe Biden, who cannot now finish a sentence, is going to face <laughs> Donald Trump, who may get many sentences? Is that really... <laughs> Is that really what we're going to? Uh, thank you. Is that really what we're going to, <laughs> well, to have going to on offer? And they're both going to be because in, in he's going to be fighting nap. all of this, and they're both old. And you know, God, God help planet Earth if, if this is what the leaders of the free world are, are, are fighting over and about. Yeah. Okay. Should we get a bit of football? Which I know is your favourite subject, both yeah. of you. But anyway, um, and all eyes obviously I'm on, keen on the football. Okay. Right. Okay. Well, I'm not sure, Jenny. Well, yeah. I'm, I'm like, <laughs> yay, English women, <laughs> go for it. I know they've got. They're in the semi-finals tomorrow. Yeah. Big rival. Between good Australia knowledge. and England, there you go. Good, that's good the limit knowledge. of my Full knowledge. Stop. Well, <laughs> uh, let me say something different to that, which is that having spent quite some time in Australia, the ferocity of the Australian support base is not to be underestimated. And one of the things that is rightly um, pointed out by those who so strongly want to support the growth of the English game in the English women's game mm -hmm. is that they just don't draw the same kinds of crowds in week to week competitions in, in the UK competitions, in English competition, uh, as the men's game. So so our women ha have not been exposed to quite the same... Of course, they did fantastically in the Euros, but they haven't walked into a, a stadium of 80,000 people baying for their blood in the way that they are about to. And, and I, yeah, they talk about an 11th, 12th, 13th person on the pitch for the Australians. It's, it, that's quite a significant contribution. Yeah, won't make any difference at all, will it? I hope not. I hope no, not. No, I hope no. not. Anyway, uh, it's a morning game, so we can watch, which is good. Often there at this time of night, and you sit there trying to watch it on a small telly. But anyway, um, we will look forward to what's... Please join the conversation. Put your comments and suggestions below in the comment section. Thank you for subscribing to this news channel. You will be notified of any breaking news and new post as you become part and parcel of the TAO Media family. Please like and share TAO Media. We love you all. Please support TAO Media Foundation by joining membership and visiting Amazon UK to purchase the displayed books to aid our orphanage projects across Africa.